I want to thank LASCAM for their support that goes back to 2014. And uh, for this session, I want to especially thank Astrid Lockhart for her collaboration. And um, now I will give the microphone to Martijn Winkler. Uh, he's a filmmaker nominated uh, for a Rose d'Or, and he's on the board of the Dutch Directors Guild. Thank you, Lorraine. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome uh, in, uh, in real life. I'm still trying to get used to that. Uh, luckily, um, in that case, we also have a bit of Zoom in this session to, you know, uh, not to make the switch to live that harsh. Um, we have two terrific guests uh, with us uh, to chat with today. Um, two directors of Astounding Works, I think, uh, and with great stories to tell. Alice Diop, um, she unfortunately cannot travel outside of France, uh, so she is stuck in cyberspace in Zoom, but I'm really happy that she, she is here uh, through this connection. So Alice, uh, bienvenue, uh, thank you for being here. And we have uh, Jérôme Clément-Villes, uh, also uh, a director, uh, and um, I'll go into what we're going to do this session, uh, but just for your information, for the first part, he will also serve a bit of a, as a translator between Alice and us here in English, um, since uh, Alice is more fluent in French. Obviously, uh, we are probably less, so uh, Jerome is happy enough to jump in to make that transition a bit easier. Um, so we're going to talk a bit about, uh, in this session, which is hosted by uh, La SCAM, uh, about careers, what it's like to have a career as a director. Uh, and when you talk about the work of a director, you talk about the artistic standpoint, uh, what it means to direct, to create films, to tell stories. Uh, and we, we have two terrific instances uh, of directors who do just that. Um, but we also talk about how do you sustain a career, how do you build that up, and how do you make well, how do you earn a living as a director? And that, that's when we come uh, into play in, in words like contracts and author's rights. Uh, so we're going to uh, make a bit of a transition about talking about the craft of direction, the artistry of, of directing, and how you're able to stay, sustain that uh, as a living. Um, so uh, I also like to, when I'm looking in the audience, uh, just to see who we have here in terms of what kind of... Uh, people who are. Are there any uh, directors uh, in the audience? Let's just raise your hand if you're, yeah, I see several directors. Any producers? We have, well, some, some people are directing and producing, that happens a lot, yes. <laughs> um, perhaps any, uh, I don't know, people from broadcasters or film funds, that, that area. Any lawyers? Nobody dares. To, oh, we have well, half a hand for a lawyer there. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we've got we've got a lot, a lot of creators here, which is great. So I, I really uh, encourage you at a certain point when we talk about uh, start talking about stuff like contracts and how to sustain a living, to also join in the conversation and ask any questions that you might have. Um, so, but before we start uh, uh, talking to Alice, I'd like to. Uh, started off with showing uh, a, the trailer of her latest film, New Us, uh, which is an astounding work. I urge you all to see it if you can. Um, but let's watch that trailer and then we'll start our talk with Elise. So we play the clip. Thank you. Nous ne signifie pas les miens, tous ceux qui sont pareils que moi, mais tous ceux qui pourront être le jeu de ce nous. L'endosser, le reprendre à leur compte, en éprouver la force. Alors, ma, je suis venu à l'Iliad. 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 Il ne s'agit pas avec nous de dire qui je suis, de me déclarer. Il ne s'agit même pas de dire comme qui je suis. Mais ce que nous pourrons faire si nous nous nouons. Mais ça, c'est les avions qui vont, frère. Euh, un jour de vol, frère. Regarde comme ils sont 
Regarde cela lui va. Mais pourquoi je me tire Quand j'en. Alors qu'on voit des amuse, c'est bien. Même là-bas, il y en a un. Regarde tout là-bas. Tu vois la vérité. Ah ouais. Nous et le résultat d'un jeu qui s'est ouvert. Qui s'est dilaté, déposé au dehors, élargi. Pourquoi est-ce que tu Ah ah, parce que je suis célèbre Parce que t'es belle Ah bah oui <rire> All right, so I hear a voice talking uh, in the trailer at that point, point. Uh, and that's your voice, isn't it, Alice? That you're, that's your, yeah, because this is, in a sense, a very personal film for you, uh, in that you, in that you, we hear your thoughts, and it's, and you talk about your own uh, family uh, uh, as well. Uh, is that was that different for you to to uh, to make it such a personal film? Euh, je dirais que tous mes films ont toujours été, enfin, sont toujours partis d'une question qui était une question euh, très personnelle. Là, je crois que c'est la première fois où, euh, où, où, je, où, je, où je travaille plus directement, enfin, où je, avec cette matière très personnelle, c'est-à-dire que je, elle ne reste pas, c'est pas un infra, euh, pas un infra langage, c'est vraiment au cœur de, de, du film, c'est-à-dire que j'utilise mes archives et les archives personnelles et les images que j'ai tournées de mon père il y a 20 ans avec qui meurt, je vais m'arrêter. <laughs> so actually Alice is saying that she's always like uh, started her films with like personal matter, but for this one it's even more personal because like basically she works with like personal uh, archives. So basically it's like the first time that she goes like this personal. Mais là, je dirais que la question intime du film n'a de sens que parce qu'elle questionne et qu'elle travaille quelque chose de beaucoup plus collectif et politique. Et pour moi, c'est un film très politique. C'est pas du tout un film intime. C'est un, un, un film très politique. Oui. But actually, what Alice is saying is basically intimate issues actually only make sense when they go political. So for Alice, this film is actually like even more political than intimate. So I feel, I feel all, all your films feel very personal in a sense that it's very much your perspective, if that's the right word. It's very, much, it's a very strong uh, perspective that's that's shown in your films. Very, the way you you shoot it, for instance, in La Permanence, which you shot yourself, right? Which is very particular and astounding in the way that you view it, which feels like you you're really looking through the eyes of the creator of the film. Uh, so, in a sense, I've, uh, all your work is very personal, but in this case, you're actually a personnage uh, yourself, right? Yeah. Exactly. In fact, it's a film that starts just from a question, that is, that the we in the film is more a question than an affirmation. And it was important, a film that tries to understand what is a community, what is a society, what is a country. To inscribe my family, to inscribe m'inscrire à l'intérieur de cette réflexion collective sur qu'est-ce qui est en nous, pour moi, était quelque chose d'essentiel. D'où mon, mon inscription, l'inscription de mon corps dans le film. Je fais partie du nous au même titre que tous les gens que je filme. So actually, so this film started off with a question, which is, what is us? And actually for Alice, us, or we, is more a question than an, uh, an affirmation. And basically, it goes into family issues, family questions, and political questions. And this is why um, Alice wanted to include her body too in the film, because basically she's uh, questioning how the I is included in society and in family. So maybe could you talk a bit about how you um, approach filmmaking from the start? I mean, this, for instance, uh, new. How, how, how did that originate? Where did you start? Was it very clear what the whole concept of the film would be? Or is it much more of a process that while you're making it or researching it, the idea grows? How does that work with you? In fact, the film starts from a book from an author called François Mascheron, who, in 30 years, wrote a book called Les Passagers du Royce Express, where he raconted a randonnée that euh, he had made around the Nuit du RER. Donc, et je pense qu'à Amsterdam, la nuit B du RER ne, ne vous dira sans doute rien, même si c'est une ligne qui, qui 
fini à, qui a son terminus à l'aéroport de Roissy. En tout cas, c'est une ligne qui a la particularité de traverser des mondes sociaux extrêmement variés. Et pour moi, c'était un, un territoire très symbolique. D'arpenter cette ligne euh, en m'inspirant de la démarche de cet écrivain était une manière de, de, de raconter, effectivement, de traverser en fait, l'histoire de la société française à partir de cette ligne éminemment symbolique. Et plus qu'elle n'est symbolique, c'est une ligne très personnelle parce que j'y ai grandi, j'y ai habité, euh, ma famille y vit encore. Donc, c'était une manière d'entremêler de, en fait, euh, une démarche euh, politique et, et, et sociologique à, à une, une, une question très, très intime encore une fois. So actually, so this particular film like uh, stands out of a book, um, which is called The Passengers of the Roissy Express by François Maspero. Uh, and actually, in this book, the author uh, depicts uh, a hiking session along the um, subway train called uh, RERB, which is very, very famous in Paris because basically it goes all the way across Paris and its suburbs and actually crosses a lot of different uh, neighborhoods, rich and poor. So actually, it did interest uh, Alice because it has um, a very strong uh historical uh meaning and also like uh, uh the symbolics of it is very powerful but actually it does have a, a also a personal meaning to alice because basically she grew up uh, along this line her family still lives there so basically like this line and uh this book were like a good way for alice to go through like these different uh worlds of like both like all intimate social symbolic and his historical et donc, peut-être pour répondre plus précisément à la question de Martine, c'est que j'ai refait le voyage il y a trois ans en prenant énormément de notes, en rencontrant des gens. Et en fait, le film s'est construit à partir de ces, de ces rencontres que j'ai faites à l'occasion de ce, de ce voyage euh, le long de cette ligne que j'ai... Euh, le long de cette ligne. C'est-à-dire que je suis partie un mois euh, avec un dessinateur. J'ai pris énormément de notes. Et en fait, à partir de ces notes, je suis retournée pendant euh, une, à, une à deux ans rencontrer et approfondir la rencontre avec chacun des, des personnages que j'avais envie de filmer pour construire le, le, pour construire le film. So, uh, C'est un dessinateur ou un peintre Un dessinateur, un aquarelliste. Un aquarelliste. Ah, ok. Uh, donc ça va, uh, ok, so actually, what Alice did uh, two years ago was to basically do like this uh, trip, this voyage uh, again two years ago to go along this line. So she took a month with the uh, aquarellist, so water painter, um, and basically take time to meet people and go along this way. And then uh, two and uh, one year ago, she uh, re-met like, uh, some people she had met again to write her stories. Uh, yeah. So I've, uh, in the film, uh, you really feel, on the one hand, this connectedness. I mean, the train is, is, a, is a, a, a symbolic, but also a very real connection between their characters. So on the one hand, this connects them. On the other hand, your characters feel very disconnected, feel very uh, alone, right? It's, it's almost, it's sometimes more about loneliness than about connection. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you maybe uh, uh, talk about that? What, what, when you went along this line, you met different characters, what were the, the characters that you met that you thought this is an interesting character for the film and why did you think that? Alors c'est vrai que moi j'ai pas voulu faire de, 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 de casting où j'ai pas voulu que chacun des personnages soit le représentant d'une catégorie sociale. Les gens que j'ai filmé, c'est des gens avec qui j'ai un rapport sensible et, et que j'avais envie de filmer pour eux, c'est-à-dire qu'ils se mettent, il n'est pas dans le film parce qu'il représente euh, la, 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 la catégorie de son papier il, il est dans le film parce que c'est quelqu'un que j'avais envie de filmer et pour, tous les, et pour tous les autres que ce soit ma soeur qui est infirmière libérale ou Pierre Bergouniou qui est écrivain c'est vraiment, ça part d'un désir de filmer ces gens-là mais c'est sûr que, que construire un film à partir des fragments de leurs histoires, pour moi c'est une manière d'interroger à la fois l'existence d'un nous de dire que finalement une communauté c'est tout ça, c'est-à-dire que ça va d'un sans papier qui vit en France depuis 20 ans à, à l'histoire d'une famille sénégalaise dont les parents sont arrivés il y a 45 ans et dont les enfants sont devenus français, à des catholiques intégristes qui célèbrent la mort de Louis XVI tous les ans. Enfin, C'est vraiment une succession comme ça de, de fragments de gens qui vivent sur un même territoire, mais qui la plupart du temps s'ignorent. Et d'une certaine façon, le but du film, c'est en additionnant tous ces récits, toutes ces histoires, c'est une manière de à la fois de, de, de questionner l'existence d'un nous, parce que qu'est-ce que ça veut dire de faire nous avec des gens qui vivent 
à côté et qu'on ne connaît pas. Et en même temps, c'est de, de réaliser par le film ce « nous » qui est toujours et encore, encore en question en France aujourd'hui. So, non, 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 c'est cool, il n'y a aucun problème. <laughs> et c'est passionnant. <laughs> so, basically, what Alice uh, just said is basically, she didn't, didn't want to do like a casting of protagonists. Basically, she didn't, she didn't want like each protagonist to stand for a social category, like meaning like the illegal immigrant or the whatever, whatever. Basically, she chose the protagonist she wanted to film out of sensitive connection to them or like more like a relationship that she created to each protagonist that she decided to film and this all these protagonists actually like made fragments of lives that I did exist uh, in this film and this is how she wanted to question the the we the us so basically um, Uh, like the world she decided to film is basically made of fragments of different stories of people who actually don't know each other. And so going into like these fragmented realities was for her also a way to question this we. Is there something such as a we, like a, a, as a us? Is, is this question uh, very, very much about French society for you or do you also see this I don't know if that's your scope, but more, uh, is it a European uh, question, maybe? Because I was wondering that. Moi, j'avais très peur. Quand je, bah, je, généralement, les films sont très français, en fait. C est, c est, vraiment, c'est un film, c'est des films qui sont très, très ancrés euh, en France et qui travaillent des questions qui m'obsèdent, hein, qui, qui, qui sont les questions d'une construction de la société française aujourd'hui, qui est traversée par euh, un certain nombre de conflits, un certain nombre de cécités, un certain nombre de de violences racistes et d'une impossibilité à, à regarder le réel. Pour moi, c'est vraiment... Mon cinéma, c'est il, il est, il est, une réponse, finalement, à cette, à cette violence de, de, de vivre dans un pays qui n'accepte pas de regarder plus, plus clairement de quoi il est constitué. Mais c'est vrai que ce film-là, j'avais l'ambition et j'avais le désir, j'avais l'intuition que c'était un film qui parlait au-delà de la France, qui parlait de la construction contemporaine des sociétés qui sont traversées par des courants migratoires qui sont traversés par les mêmes questions, en fait. Et c'est vrai que la sélection du film à Berlin, le prix à Berlin et tous les, les, les retours de, de, de tous les, les festivals où je suis allée depuis un an, euh, donc euh, aussi bien en Tchécoslovaquie, en Autriche, euh, en Angleterre, je vois bien que, que le film leur parle profondément de leur contemporain. Et donc ça, c'est quelque chose qui m'a profondément euh, rassurée et, et qui me fait euh, un bien fou. Euh, juste une question, tu parlais de tes films qui sont très français, au ouais. début de... Ok, d'accord. Ok, so, um, Alice just said that basically all her films, her, uh, her movies are like very, very French, and basically they question French history and how like basically Fr uh, France re relate to itself. And there's a lot of things that, you know, like are not shown, like French uh, racist violence, and basically our country, France, cannot really look at itself and see how it's built, like all the movements it, be, it's, um, it stems from. And, but, but actually, uh, what happened is like uh, through like her selection in Berlin, the award she won, and uh, all her selection is different in other European countries, like she could feel like a, a very strong interest in these issues. And basically these uh, issues do uh, cross a lot of uh, societies across Europe, or basically like uh, these countries want to actually look at the way they're built and the, all the influences of migrations in their story, uh, history. I'd like maybe at this point it'd be interesting to watch the trailer for one of your previous films, La Permanence, which I feel is very uh, current and, and also a very much a European film uh, mm -hmm. in a sense, while it's very French, of course, at the same time, mm -hmm. it illustrates your point, I think. So maybe can we play the clip from La Permanence? Hopefully with sound. Euh, depuis que vous êtes arrivé, es arrivé en France, euh, j'imagine que tu n'es pas venu avec un visa, puisque tu es... 
Oui, non, dès que, non depuis que je suis arrivé le 30 mai, ça au moins, c'est sûr. 30 mai. Oui. Mais avec un passeport Oui, avec un passeport. Vous avez le passeport Non, je l'ai même pas. C'était un... pas le passeport à toi, de toute façon, non, non c'est un non, faux non. passeport, non. probablement. Ben non, parce qu'il est, euh, je veux dire, il s'est fait, euh, je veux dire, euh, il, il a eu euh, euh, l'armée là-bas, euh, donc il est parti comme il a pu, quoi. So this this is such a um, heart wrenching film. I think to watch, you really, um, you see a bit of that here, obviously. But the the effect of the whole film is that you become, on the one hand, so close to these people, on the other hand, you feel very much detached in, in the world that they're set in, uh, the world of regulations and rules and passports and the frustrations, both from the doctor, because these are all people in a uh, who visit a doctor, right? The doctors posts for various medical or uh, psychiatric reasons and then slowly you find out what's what the turmoil is in their minds um, uh, it's uh, you've you've really set uh, said it in a very radical way that it's just in this enclosed space where you're in you're, there's no escaping it um, so also how, how my question is how long uh, for this film how long did you uh, research and shoot it because it it, it 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 took a lot of time I feel to make this. Merci beaucoup pour votre remarque. Euh, en fait, tous mes films, c'est des films qui, qui que j'ai toujours euh, écrit et repéré pendant euh, longtemps. Euh, nous, tout à l'heure, je, je disais que c'est presque deux ans de repérage et d'écriture. Et la permanence, c'est plus d'un an. Je suis restée un an euh, à l'intérieur de ce cabinet, de cette consultation. Euh, de médecine générale, en fait, qui accueille des, des hommes euh, totalement isolés, sans papier, et, et dont, en fait, les souffrances physiques ne révèlent qu'une souffrance existentielle liée à leur statut, euh, à leur, leur non-reconnaissance, finalement, de, et, à leur, et à la douleur de l'exil. Et c'est vrai que pour euh, accepter d'être à cet endroit, pour que ces hommes m'acceptent, euh, j'ai filmé quasiment... J'ai commencé le tournage un an après avoir débuté des repérages où j'allais chaque semaine assister à ces consultations et le tournage en lui-même a duré aussi un an. Ok, so uh, what Ali says is basically for all her films, like she takes a lot of time to write and to scout, and for this film actually, like uh, she took a year without a camera just to meet the people, to be accepted, to get accepted, because basically this place, so this con consultation space is where a lot of lonely, like all the people crossing this space are like very lonely and, and suffering, especially out of their uh, status of uh, exiled people. And so basically in this space, she took like a, a year without filming before taking the camera, and then another year um, to st like uh, of filming. So I, I think that's, in this craft of documentary directing, that's a very um, unique aspect in, in, in terms of, of uh, having a career and making a living, this huge, um, let's say, um, investment in time, uh, effort, and also personal investment, if your personal story, investing in other people to, you know, to get them to work with you. Uh, so my, how, how do you approach that in terms of, let's say, uh, funding or uh, making, making a living as a director? I mean, is this, is this an easy uh, effort? How, how, do you, how do you manage to, to create if it takes so, such a long time before the film is finally finished? 
Alors là, je veux bien que tu me... Parce que je ne crois pas avoir complètement compris. C'est une question de comment tu vis euh, avec ce temps si long. Euh... Oui, exactement. Donc la question, c'était euh, euh, surtout pendant la période d'écriture, etc., qui prend énormément de temps. Et donc du coup, bah, voilà, donc, comment tu réussis à quand même gagner ta vie avec des temps qui sont aussi longs ça, ouais, ouais, ça, ça, ça a été très compliqué euh, jusqu'à récemment, en fait. Euh, mais pour des, d des, des raisons que je pourrais expliquer tout à l'heure en fait c'est quasiment impossible parce que le temps de vivre euh, de l'écriture parce qu'il le, le, y a très peu d'aide à l'écriture il y a très peu de financement à l'écriture il y a très peu de développement c'est-à-dire qu'il y, y a peu de producteurs en tout cas moi ma productrice elle n'a pas forcément les moyens elle n'a pas du cash pour, pour me permettre de, de me en tout cas dans, sur, sur la permanence je crois que c'était plus compliqué euh, que sur nous où là j'ai pu un peu euh, avoir une somme qui n'était pas extrêmement confortable pour pouvoir écrire. Et effectivement, c'est donner des cours à côté, c'est faire pas mal d'activités, en fait, pour avoir... J'ai dû, voilà, dû inventer une manière de, de travailler à côté pour pouvoir financer l'écriture. Et ça a été des stages que j'ai donnés, des formations à la FEMIS ou, dans, ou aux ateliers dans des écoles de cinéma. Et, et, et ouais, c'est essentiellement ça, c'est des choses... Je n'ai jamais pu vivre, euh, travailler confortablement, euh, euh, enfin, avoir ce temps d'écriture confortable. En fait. J'ai toujours dû inventer quelque chose pour pouvoir le financer. So, what Alice is saying is basically, it's very complicated. <laughs> And even like impossible. Basically, it's impossible to be paid fully, to be fully paid for like the writing and development phases, um, uh, to live off writing. Uh, actually, like there are like f really few grants like uh, aimed at financing like writing and development, and what she's saying is basically her producer didn't have like enough cash to actually subsidize all of this phase. So basically, Al uh, Alice had to come up with like with new ways to basically make a living, and so she gave uh, workshops, classes. Um, like to like various schools, including uh, Femis, which is like the biggest school in, in Paris, in France, actually. And so basically, uh, since it's impossible to live off like your your work, especially like during this really long phase, she had like to find other ways to make a living. Uh, Let me also transition because your role as a translator, now I'm going to ex expand <laughs> it a bit <laughs> to a role as a guest also. So it's going to be very complicated. But um, uh, I want to dive into your work as a director. But before I do that, uh, you were also uh, a board member of uh, La SCAM. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was wondering, uh, do you hear this a lot uh, in the sense that, that documentary directors and how it, it's such a special Uh, craft which asks so much time uh, and how how to finance that basically uh, as director that that's complicated as you, as Alice said do you hear that a lot yeah I, of course I do hear it a lot uh, like a lot of uh, directors and authors have like really like struggle to make a living of their work so some of them you know like it's really like they even like make less than the minimum wage in France so it's it's a really hard Uh, situation so I hear it around me but I hear it also like politically because like I think there there is a global awareness of like basically the hardships of authors and this global awareness, uh, awareness has been rising like for like a couple of years I, I guess you know so it's coming to the public debate more and more so and that's good actually and um, I mean it, are there are uh, Are there easy solutions to this kind of complicated question? Um, no, 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 no. I think, f like to me, like uh, the way I see it as a director, as a friend of other directors, and as a commissioner at LASCAM, is basically you need to work at all levels. So the first level is the contract, and I think we're going to go into it afterwards. Basically, is uh, I have to fight, like, like my contracts too and when people ask me to read their contracts also like I give them advice and this is like the first level and it can really change things basically if you start like negotiating your contracts it do does change your income so it does have like a, a, a level of uh, efficiency in your life uh, and then you have like all the political levels so LASCAM works also kind of like a union like to make it simple and so you have like a um, more like, uh, like political pressure that you you can uh, you you can push also 
Uh, maybe a question back at Alice. Uh, this, uh, while you're juggling income, may trying to you know uh, uh, trying to get financing or, or get your own or earn a living while you're doing this long-term research, does it complicate things? Does it make your artist work more difficult, or does it maybe also uh, add to that? If you know what I mean. Est-ce que en fait, la question c'est est-ce que le fait de que ce soit si difficile de trouver de l'argent ça impacte la question de la création Exactement. Là, je parle pas si mal. <rire> je parle, en tout cas. Je sais pas parler. Je euh, en fait, c'est à la fois. Moi, je trouve que moi, l'écriture et tout le travail de repérage qui est très long, euh, pour moi, c'est quelque chose d'essentiel. Et le problème, c'est que c'est tellement long que généralement, quand je quand j'arrive à parce que c'est un, un dossier qui euh, me satisfait, il n'est plus du tout euh, possible de l'envoyer dans des organismes de financement tels que l'ASCAM ou euh, le CNCA, pour euh, expliquer plus précisément euh, en fait, euh, les brouillons d'un rêve. Et, euh, et donc, en fait, c'est à la fois... Un... Ouais, je pense que là où ça impacte, c'est que c'est beaucoup, beaucoup, beaucoup moins confortable. Et en même temps, j'ai l'impression, mais ça, je pense que ça vraiment, ça tient qu'à moi. Et c'est pas du tout un argument politique, mais euh, j'ai l'impression que jusqu'à présent, cet inconfort-là m'a obligé à ne jamais, euh, comment dire, à pas être dans un, quelque chose de, de, de mou. J ai, j ai, en tout cas, j'ai tellement toujours travaillé dans cette urgence, dans cette difficulté-là, et que c'est presque comme si le fait que ce soit difficile, mais c'est là où c'est un peu névrosé, hein, névrotique aussi. Hein, c'est que c'est presque comme si ça ça, 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 ça précisait, ça challengeait le désir du film. Et c'est très étrange, parce que je, je, qu'est-ce que ce serait de travailler dans, dans le confort À mon avis, je pense que mes films en seraient plus grands, parce que, mais, mais je ne l'ai tellement jamais éprouvé jusqu'à présent que, que j'ai le sentiment que... que, 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 que en fait, j'ai trouvé le, le moyen d'en faire quelque chose qui, qui me force et qui a... a, a je ne sais pas si vous voyez ce que je, tu vois ce que je veux dire. À, mm -hmm. À, 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 enfin, à éprouver, à éprouver sans cesse le désir du film. Et mais je trouve que c'est à, à la fois totalement névrotique et c'est surtout que, que repose euh, ce système de domination à notre défaveur, en fait, sur notre désir, finalement. So basically, so what I, uh, uh, Alice just said is basically how writing and scouting phase is so long that basically, basically when she gets to an actual piece of writing, uh, it's already too late to send it to grants because basically she's ready to to film and then because like the the longest it takes so so long to to get to this first piece of writing that it's it doesn't go really well with like the agenda or the schedules of uh, film grants and as far as like basically the inf the influence on her the like, creation is concerned it's a double sided uh, answer so of course first it's it's not comfortable and it's hard but what she wonders about is basically maybe it's it's uh, it prevents her to go soft. Basically, it's more like a challenge. It's a challenge for her, like uh, to struggle, to go like to be urgent, to go into like the like why do I do this and why is it uh, urgent to do it right now? So what she questions is like basically this double-sided answer might be a little bit neurotic because basically uh, it's accepting also like a dom domination system over us because of course we as authors are kind of the victims of like a financing system that you know like it's, it's not able to finance us uh, properly yeah I, I, and that's why i asked it because it seems that somehow it's the struggle that that you have while making the film somehow mirrors the struggle of your characters in in a sense right their economical social struggle um uh Let's let's um, before we we go on. Uh, let's watch uh, a clip, uh, the trailer for your latest film, uh, and then we'll we'll talk a bit further. So here is uh, yeah, there we go. La nuit c'est tellement silencieux, c'est calme. C'est mystique en même temps et je sais pas. T'as plus le choix du temps, t'étais... Le temps te court moins près, tu vois. 
c'est dans le sens c'est plus toi qui cours après le temps. Moi, je sais que la nuit, je, je, je... T'as dit retour T'as ton casque 20 minutes Tu peux répéter demain T'as dit quoi Les flics tombent C'est un crock, donc t'as dit voilà, l'humain vit la journée, dort la nuit. En journée, il faut être opérationnel, la nuit, il faut dormir. Bah ben non. So, Jérôme, you, you, um, this was your uh, latest film, which was at ITFA uh, yeah. a couple of years ago. Uh, yeah. You've been here uh, as with several films. Uh, yeah, I had like two films here, yeah. my two last films, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, yeah, your, your, um, your career has been very uh, uh, interesting. You, I mean, you've, you've come from, you've not done like the traditional uh, build up as a director with the film school. You've really, Um, uh, what's the word? Autodidact, or uh, yeah? Could you maybe uh, talk about how your career started as a director? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, actually, so I I didn't go to film school before making films. I did a lot of different jobs. I was a woodworker, caretaker in a in an elder's house, and actually, I never thought of making documentary. And I, I started in porn, uh, feminist porn, uh, for Canal Plus, and then I was hired at a, as an assistant on a series of documentaries for like, uh, actually around sexuality issues, and this is how I dis discovered like this film, and I don't know, it just grabbed me, and then uh, starting as a assistant director, and then I, I started like ma making my films, um, yeah, I even at the same time, actually. So, actually I learned Uh, my ways maybe more like with mentors because I've been like assistant especially of two directors uh, Actually one was uh, uh, on the board of last camp too. And so yeah, this is how I got to know I was like I got to to learn on the ground So so the idea of let's say hustling or trying to making money earning a living is is it's is something which is very much part of your nature as a director maybe, more than others who are more maybe traditionally schooled. Yeah, I mean, especially because when I started making films, uh, so these, like my first films were not as much financed as the ones that I'm making now, but I always made sure that, you know, like the way money is uh, is shared in the, in the budget is, um, let's say, fair. And I never wanted to, to have a nuts out job like, uh, Like I never, I was proposed to teach and everything, and I was refused. And I was like, no, I'm supposed to make a living out of my work. So basically, from even when I had like a lower budget, I always because, but it was like a heavy negotiations with the production companies to say, okay, I need my fair share of the budget because I'm the core of it. Um, and even like um, like with like documentary shorts, there are ways like like to get more money out of the uh, out of the budget is that a topic that directors uh, documentary directors li like to discuss money is that something that's easy no definitely not and i think uh, it's i mean i would say in france that maybe it's hard to talk about money like in general but also because um, a lot of directors uh, feel isolated and this is something that's really important for me like to share with you it's basically talk to each other because like sometimes you, when you talk to another uh, director or author, you know, like she or he can give you an input of, no, no, I was paid to do this. I was paid to do this and oh, this is not enough what you make. And basically being together makes make us uh, stronger. So basically, um, since I'm now, you know, a commissioner at LASCAM, a lot of uh, authors call me and have me read the contracts. And I think that's good because Basically, um, there are like a, a contract has to be negotiated. It's not like, and I think that the authors don't dare talking about it because they don't, they're not sure about their value. And they don't realize that the core value of a documentary, of a film, is the author. So when they sign a contract for them, it's kind of a, uh, something nice the producer do to them, does to them. 
And it's not true. Like, it's something nice that you do to the producer to sign a contract with them. Or at least it's an equal relationship. And so the thing is like, and also the thing is like, it's the producer's job to write contracts, and it's not your job to, to read it. So basically, this is why helping each other or like talking to um, lawyers or whatever can be helpful because basically uh, you need to level up you know, your uh, knowledge to be able to talk like equally with the, the producer. So, so, for instance, what, what what is in a contract which is very important for directors to to read or to know, or and, and what can you, I mean, what can you change in a contract? It, it feels so definite, right? Mm. Okay. So, what is special? Okay, if you work as a technician, you will be paid a wage. Uh, if you work as an author, basically you're selling something. Uh, which are your rights on the film, meaning that the producer buys the, the right to use your work of art. Or, to make it more precise, he rents it, meaning that there's a duration to your contract. So, uh, basically, what you, you can negotiate almost everything. Of course, there's a law, but now European laws uh, actually do protect the other rights. So, basically, it's basically a answering like WH qu uh, questions. Who, why, how, and everything. So, when you get to who, for instance, is basically who has the power. Uh, producers usually they will they will write like uh, notes on the contract saying okay articles saying okay I can add you uh, other authors or I can replace you. So this is the who who has the final cut who has the power, and and then there's the how much question, which is of course what we're dealing with. So. Usually, what uh, uh, it depends on the countries, but usually, uh, documentary directors are paid like a flat rate. So, meaning, okay, I'm going to give you like this precise amount of money for to make the film, which is a problem, and actually, we're fighting against it uh, uh, now in France. So, this is the how much. So, of course, this you can negotiate. But so, so this flat rate, for instance, if you make a film like Elise, and you, it takes you two years. Mm -hmm. uh, that flat rate becomes a lot less interesting, I guess, right? Yeah, definitely. And this is why, to me, I always advise directors to go, because like, usually what producers say, okay, no, but we cannot count your, your, count your days of working because it's so much. So they do agree on this. But I always talk to, uh, tell the directors, no, come with the schedule and say, okay, this is going to take me, I don't know, like uh, eight months full time. So let's divide the, the total amount, uh, amount by months. And usually it's really ridiculous. So this is like the first flight rate. But something that I really would like to stress upon, because usually, and producers are right when they say, OK, I don't have enough money to, uh, to give you more. And it can be true. But usually what happens is usually you negotiate your contract uh, with the first budget, meaning usually with only the first broadcaster. So they would say, OK, I have, like, let's say, 200 k for the documentary or the 100 k or whatever. So with this amount, I can give you like this flat rate. But what really can make a change for like your income is basically, OK, say, OK, I want uh, an actual percentage of every uh, money that's going to go after. Meaning that if you get like on top of the um, broadcaster, if they get like uh, grants, if they can uh, get other broadcaster, distributor, whatever, uh, other money, then I'm interested in this money because you know, like it's part of, uh, you know, I'm like the the movie is based on me, and this is something that I really advise to to do when you negotiate a contract, and like to me, like for instance, when I do, I did. Um, Spring, which is like a short documentary that, it, that I did, that opened in uh, Rotterdam. And basically, there were like really li little money, uh, just like a little public funding. But what I, what I did was like, okay, I almost work for free. So I want, and I'm, I'm, I'm telling you it's true, I'm like, big, I'm the main producer of the film. So I want, and I got 80% of the royalties. I'm like, I'm the producer. So, and it does make me now, because it's still screened in the museums or festival, and it does make me like, uh, uh, I don't know, like a thousand euros a, a year. So it, it is re really helpful, especially when you work in fragile budgets, to actually like negotiate hard. And when it goes to percentage, it's not a big risk for the producer, because basically you're just 
betting on the success of the money. But it's re it, it really can make a big change for you. I think it's a good point because I don't want to make it like it's us against producers. No, producers no, no, no. Have, you know, it's just the budgets are low, so you know, it, it's not they can't pull money out of thin air. But this is a way to think about what you're creating. That what's maybe if there's money made from the film when it's finished, that you're, uh, you know, you get a substantial uh, percentage or income of that. Uh, do you have any idea in in your experience? Is this done a lot, or do do directors negotiate their contracts enough? Okay, so uh, it's uh, I don't think so because a lot of I mean like people who come to me or who I talk to usually they say me okay uh, they tell me I didn't even read the contract or it was too complicated or whatever so at least there are like a couple of numbers that you, if you don't want to read the whole like 20 pages there are a couple of numbers that you are to look into especially the length of uh, rights you're selling, meaning, okay, am I giving out my rights for 10 or 30 years or 70 years? Of course, the flat rate, and then the, per, uh, the percentage of royalties. And these are the three figures, uh, the three, three numbers that you want to go into. And But usually, unfortunately, uh, they don't. And I think, and you were talking about like something ne neurotic, <laughs> because I think it also comes from the fact that we don't think we deserve it. And because like, if a technician comes, like a, has to come a second day because there's a problem uh, in the shooting, whatever, you cannot film the protagonist, he's not available, whatever, he's gonna ask for another day of wage. And, but you don't dare to. And to me, the first thing is to change, I mean, one of the things is to change one's mindset. I have an example, I'm, I just finished yesterday a film. And so we had a lot of, you know, like uh, changes of programs because of COVID. And at some point, I just said to the uh, executive producer, and I was like, okay, if you can, I know that, you know, we have like spent too much, everything was complicated, but if you can, please give a little more. And she did. And I didn't, you know, I didn't, you know, shout, I didn't yell. And it's just like, you can always like, at least say it and then see. And uh, maybe in, in, in terms of this discussion, an organization like uh, SCUM, which is French, but every country has uh, a, an organization like SCUM, right? Um, could you explain a bit what, what, what do you do? What does SCUM do in this, in this instance? Okay, so now in European law, authors are entitled to receive a, share, uh, a fair share of the income of their film meaning as soon as a film is used or like uh, exploited, uh, they have to have a share. So it's been in French law for years and it's been in uh, European law for uh, since uh, 2019, okay? But the thing is like if um, a broadcaster uh, like uh, airs a film, it's hard for this broadcaster to give money to each other and to call, okay, uh, hello Alice, uh, I, need, uh, I owe you uh, this money. So basically, uh, what LASCAM does and other collective uh, organization, collective right organization, basically we take the money off of these broadcasters and we give out to uh, the authors. So um, in France, this like the the this French uh, society is maybe is the biggest in in Europe because we take money from almost all. Uh, the, um, the ways to exploit uh, documentaries. So we, we take it from broadcasters, but also from Netflix, from YouTube and everything. So basically we hand out a, a more than 100 million euros a year to uh, authors. And then uh, with this money, we also like, have work more like as a union. Basi basically we defend the rights of authors to Broadcasters, we are, we are now negotiate, uh, ne negotiating uh, something with the France Television and also, of course, with the Ministry of Culture, with everyone. So we advocate, basically, our rights. And now, the, this time is very crucial because we can feel, as I said, like a global awareness around these issues. And then, uh, which is why we're here now. Also, we had like a, we spend money on culture, uh, cultural action. So basically, we give we give money to grants. Uh, Brouillon d'Arrêt, we talked about it. It's a filming grant. We we give out awards to best documentaries of the year for life lifelong achievement and everything. And also, uh, and and also we fund festivals, including uh, ITFA. And this is very much about a collective, right? I mean, the board which you are on uh, is made up of. 
Film directors. Yeah. Uh, so directors and authors. Directors uh, and authors. So actually, we, are, we not only represent documentary directors, we also represent uh, radio uh, authors, uh, photographers, uh, like uh, other fields of uh, uh, state uh, right holders. But like the main income is uh, documentary and reports. I just want to take a look into the audience if I can see if there's any uh, questions which are, uh, have arisen about uh, for G either Jerome or Alice. Please uh, don't be uh, bashful and raise your hand and I can see if there's any. Yeah, we have a question in the back and we have a microphone coming towards you. Um, do you have... Hey, how are you? Hello, uh, I'm good. Hi. Uh, my name is uh, Amr Saeed. I'm uh, Egyptian, based here in Amsterdam, uh, working on a multicultural film. And I'm curious if you have, in your experience, worked um, on a documentary that is exploring different cultures. So in terms of co-productions, say I'm, I'm working with different Mediterranean citizens. How do you go about that? Do you do you seek productions from every single country or you say, okay, there is one other co-producer. How do you secure financing to this multitude of cultures? Are there certain programs that you can recommend? Thank you. Okay, so I'm not a producer, so it's not my work, but from my experience, so I filmed a lot abroad, in, uh, like before I would work a lot on war zones. Now I film a lot in Haiti and in Canada. And from my experience, a lot of producers are, um, I mean, like it's certain types of producers who are interested in going into co-production. And especially producers who work with like big broadcasting companies in France, usually they say, okay, let's make it simple and take the one big income of money. And then you have producers who are like more keen to actually like go to the ITFA forum or like, be, uh, like a festival places where you can actually pitch your film. So I would say it's more like a, of a uh, company culture. Then you have like, uh, like different countries have different, um, let's say, um, like, okay, for instance, Canada has big money. Like, uh, they have, like, a big, uh, uh, like, um, film organization that gives out money. And other countries are not really int interesting to go into co-production. So it, it's really, it really depends. But if you are, um, if you want this, you really need to, to check into the companies, the production companies that you uh, co uh, contact. Any other question from the audience? If there any other arises, don't don't uh, hesitate. And, oh, we've got one here in front. Can we get? Yeah, we've got a microphone towards you. Hey, uh, um, the uh, this new European uh, law about um, royalties is fun. Um, does that cover just Europe? Like you know, for Lescam. Do you have to be a French national to appreciate that? Or like, we have a project that's going to air on French television, but as an American production, does that, does it, does it, is that something shared amongst the, um, across borders, is that European only? Okay, so there are like collective management organizations in a lot of countries in Europe. Uh, the thing, the, what makes a difference between one to another is basically the rights, like the royalties that they can gather or they can, they can collect. And as I said, France, uh, like LASCAM is very powerful because beca we, the, the biggest money we actually collect from is what we call primary broadcasters, which are, which are like the biggest broadcasters. I, biggest, uh, I believe that in, uh, in the Netherlands, it's more like the cable TV you gather money from. Yeah, cable yeah. And, yeah. and starting Netflix and, and the streamers are coming in. Yeah. So basically, okay, so there like it's, um, let's say it's a two-sided answer because like, uh, like from wh whatever country you come from, you need. Yeah, I really advise you to basically to to go like into these societies, these organizations. Of course, to advocate like for like to broaden this uh, like uh, where they get, gather uh, money from, but also like what this directive um, pushed to is basically your like uh, production companies are not allowed anymore anywhere in Europe to sign you what uh, we call um, a copyright type of contract, meaning we give you only the flat fee. So now, 
in no place in Europe, uh, you're supposed to, to only be paid a flat fee. They have to give you uh, uh, a royalty. So no more buyouts, right? That's buyouts, yeah, exactly. So I had like the, actually for this one, it's funny because like the production company wanted me to sign a US contract. I was like, but I'm French, but they had like um, uh, a bureau based in the US, and of course they wanted to have a, what we call a buyout, meaning only the flat fee. And they were like, uh, uh, then, oh, then we can sign a Swiss contract, which is even worse for the author. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm French, I'm, so let's sign a French contract. So yeah, so in countries where like uh, um, collective uh, management organizations are not, uh, don't cover like so, so much uh, rights, then uh, you're even like more, I would advise you to go more into like the uh, royalty uh, percentage. In France, like what we usually it's like minimum 10, 15%. So maybe um, you know, to round off our, our chat, I'd like to ask a final question to both of you. Uh, maybe at least first, um, uh, when you're further in your career and you're making several films, does it become easier? I mean, and I ask this question both artistically, but also uh, let's say financially. Does it become easier, or is it? Does it become harder, or does it? How does that? How do you see that change during your career? C'est sûr que c'est plus simple, je pense, et même dans la négociation des contrats. Uh, parce qu'il euh, y, y a beaucoup plus de financement, parce que, je, parce que les films aussi reposent de plus en plus sur mes no mon nom. J'ai plus de facilité, en tout cas pour nous, j'ai eu beaucoup plus de facilité à trouver des, des financements. Arte est rentré très tôt, c'est un grand format, donc c'est un film qui a été très bien financé. On a eu un certain nombre d'aides de, de, aussi euh, de régions. Donc c'est sûr que, que ça a été plus simple aussi. Et je crois que j'ai acquis aussi, une, une, comme j'ai fait aussi de la fiction, là je viens de terminer un, un, un tournage d'une fiction, Et c'est d'autres euh, habitudes, en tout cas de négociations, qui sont beaucoup plus dures en, en fiction et beaucoup plus, et finalement beaucoup plus acceptées. Alors que le documentaire, il y a toujours cette part affective et dans, à, à, qui, qui nous dessert beaucoup les auteurs, parce qu'on est dans des rapports beaucoup plus, euh, beaucoup plus directs avec des producteurs qui peuvent être des amis, qui peuvent être, c'est mon cas, des gens avec qui on, on côtoie depuis, tout, de, depuis longtemps. Dans la fiction, c'est beaucoup plus froid. Il y a beaucoup plus, par exemple, j'ai un agent. Euh, qui négocie mes contrats de fiction et qui ne négociait pas jusqu'à présent mes contrats documentaires. Donc je pense que le fait d'être passé par là, je pense que j'aurais beaucoup plus de légitimité à, à revendiquer en fait mes droits parce que les films, les films reposent essentiellement sur mon nom, ce qui n'était pas le cas peut-être il y a dix ans. Aujourd'hui, c'est mon nom qui finance plus que, que, la, que, le, que la production qui arrive à... Donc je sais que j'ai un impact dans, la, dans, dans, la, dans, comment dire, dans, le, dans le financement du film. So, ça me rend plus forte, en tout cas, pour négocier avec le producteur. So, uh, so yeah, Alice said that uh, yeah, obviously it's easier for her to finance her films. Uh, like for instance, this film, uh, the first film we watched, uh, like had uh, Arte coming in uh, really early in the, uh, uh, through the financing, and in a big, uh, so it's called Grand Format, which is like a well-financed um, section of Arte. Um, and uh, and then they could get more and more money from like other fundings, like more selective fundings from regions and everything. Um, so now she actually just finished the fiction, and apparently, like uh, fiction, uh, in fiction, is more uh, accepted and more used to you're more used to negotiating hard and hard and hard. And uh, so now she feels more legitimate when she negotiates a contract and to when, uh, like a documentary contract because basically uh, the film is finding uh, it gets money out of her name. So basically she had she's more legitimate uh, to ask for more money or like to negotiate her contract. Uh, so she, yeah, she does feel stronger now. And then uh, the other hat, the other hat. <laughs> oh, sorry. No, because of time. Uh, let, let's, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, of course. Like for me, it's, it's. Let's say that. Uh, okay, from the fund funding part of it, of course, it's more like uh, it's easier for me now that I've gained awards and everything. So of course, when you to you talk to a producer or a broadcaster or like to a f uh, like. Uh, um, whatever grant, basically, you of course you have a name, so they more like just for with you. Um, and then, as far as contract is concerned, basically, when I first, I'm kind of negotiating the same things, and even like, I, maybe I think I was harder before, but now the thing, I'm more, uh, I feel safer 
asking what I do. Meaning that when I ask things before, I was only, uh, I was lonely. I was like, but this is not right. This is not fair. And now I just come and say, okay, this is it. This is, okay, it's minimum 10%. No, 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 no. And um, because I shared with other directors and I know that what I'm asking for is not crazy. And I think that before when I started, you know, they wanted me to sign like contracts for a beginner. And so I would say that now I feel more stable and basically I'm like, okay, what I'm, what I'm asking for is just like, it's first it's lawful because sometimes they propose you unlawful things, but also it's just like fair. So it's it's about growing more confident in your own value. Yeah, I guess. definitely. Right here, both of you, the more the more experience you get, the more relaxed and confident you are that you are actually the most valuable person in the room, <laughs> and you and that you know you can ask a a, 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 a normal uh, percentage or fee for that. Um, and uh, we have to round off, so um, I'd really like to thank both of you. Uh, merci, Alice. Thank you so much for joining us uh, and sharing. Je viens d'être là, mais je suis contente qu'on ait pu, uh, malgré tout, maintenir ce, ce rendez-vous, malgré les désarts vraiment de papier. So Alice is very really uh, happy that we could still maintain this uh, appointment together, even like with these hardships. Thank you so much, and thank, thank you, you, Jérôme, for <laughs> this double effort. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, thank you so much. Merci, Alice. <laughs> thank you.